The following Degrassi video contains strong language and strong opinions that are my personal opinions. You are free to what go making your own opinions on what I'm trying to say about the Degrassi shooting timeline. Your discretion is strongly advised. With that in mind, welcome to another video on this day of reckoning. That being October 11, 2019, 15 years after Time Stands Still Part 2, the episode that shook up Degrassi was made. My name is Jeff Cutter Historical Diamond, or Cutter Gaki as I'm known in the Degrassi Reddit. And welcome to this video. Um, you can probably guess how serious I am by just wearing a normal black attire and all that. And yes, this is my real look, my real face, and my real hair. I'm 34 years old, by the way, so. So anyway, I will be talking to you about my real opinions about the Degrassi shooting timeline. Not really making videos and all that, but just like making honest opinions of it and all that. And as the disclaimer says, you're free to make your own opinions. If you don't agree with stuff about me, that's fine. I don't care as long as it's within good talking and not basically making threats. So anyway, a few questions about me, I guess you probably want to know, is number one, why am I involved in this? In the Degrassi shooting timeline, how did I become this? And two, why did I start making videos? Well, number one is that, strange as it sounds, like, I, w I used to watch Degrassi Next Generation, um, the first three seasons at home at my farm in Plattsville, Ontario. And then I moved to Kitchener, which where I, which I am here right now, to go to college for computer programming, which I got a diploma, but it didn't go that far. And ironically, that was the year that season four happened and when Time Stand Still happens and all that. I basically didn't really look at Degrassi Next Generation as much as I used to, mostly because, you know, I was a college student and all that. But I did see bits and pieces of the episodes. And then, like, about five, six years ago, I started watching the Degrassi um, – Next Generation playthroughs on Much Music. It's a specialty channel in Canada. Now, I know that a lot of Americans watch this video and they're probably going to be confused and all that. I will try to be as non Canadian as possible, but remember, Degrassi is a Canadian production. So basically, this is from a Canadian point of view. If you want an American point of view, I would recommend seeing Not a Vampire and their videos. Uh, Not a Vampire being N O T A. V A M P Y R E. I will probably give you a link in the description below. Also, and also note that non vampire goes by the personal pronoun of they now. So basically, that's what I'm supposed to call them. I'm bound to slip up what, once in a while, but I'll try my best to be calm and all that. But anyway, getting back to the point that, yeah, I saw bits and pieces of it. And you'll be wondering, why this thing? Why are you making videos on it? Well, here's the thing. I always thought that the Degrassi shooting thing with Rick Murray and all that was very important. I remember vividly about Rick being with Terry in season three, just before I went to college. So basically what ends up happening is that, you know, he went back to school with vengeance on his mind and nearly killed Emma and all that. Now, Bear, now, bear in mind that I had some preconceived notions about the Degrassi universe for many years, like on basically hating on Emma because, you know, if Emma deserved to have a gun in her face and all that, and Ratch deserved to be kicked to the curb or punched out by me for what he did. Now, of course, that was a couple of years ago. I'm just telling you now so that you can get proper context. This is not like what I think about now. Basically, using two years of research. I've decided to do this thing. So anyway, um, yeah, so a little bit of background on myself is needed because people don't know this, but I technically am a chief analyst for my friend's um, startup called Tender Tool. It's basically to help property managers with get tenders with approved trades, like, you know, trying to save money and all that and trying to cut down on paper because, you know, the environment and all that. Using my analysis, analytic mind, which has not been completely proven, although I did a nice um, document on 
comparing um, NFL pick'em seasons from 2008 and 2016. Those are the two years that I actually did not have a losing record in any week. And I also did an analysis on the 93 and 2017 Stanley Cup playoffs and the amount of overtime games and all that. So, yeah, I'll probably give you it if you prefer. But anyway, um, so, yeah, I use my analytic mind to anal try to analyze as much as I can about the regression shooting timeline. So this is what I'm going to do. So basically, I'm going to tell you my honest opinions about looking at the regression timeline. Like, I know that I basically have done a video explaining the timeline and all that, and I've done plenty of videos basically on bits and pieces, like, you know, Radish's failed opportunities, Rick, why he should be blamed for it, and basically what the hell did Rick do wrong, what characters should have done with this situation, a lot of aftermaths and all that, so yeah. Um, do note that a lot of my um, videos, I think all my videos that are in the playlist that I will link to down below, um, actually has been nothing for sure but research that them I meet and basically taken apart by not a vampire who made their points and all that. I know that I feel guilty for stealing stuff off their videos and all that because, you know, but th that person actually made me realize what type of preconceived notions I had and how to stop them. So logically, um, I listened and I took down notes and I looked at things and I looked at Degrassi Reddit posts, which I put a ton of up online and all that. So yeah, I figured there was a Degrassi Reddit community that would help me get rid of my stupid preconceived notions and all that. So anyway, um, first part of the analysis is before things got riled up in season four. So basically there were some episodes in season three. Now I don't know the episode titles off by hand, but I know that Rick was trying to get to Terry and basically what ends up happening is that, you know, Terry doesn't have a relationship with a boy like her friends, Paige, Hazel, and Ashley. So she's trying to fit in. She finds Rick in her locker with a rose and is happy to have a boyfriend. Unfortunately, Rick becomes controlling and practically does not like Terry at all and takes advantage of Terry. Thankfully, she decides to dump his ass. But knowing that, you know, everyone else is going through with their relationships and she may never find one, she told herself she should get back together with Rick to everyone's chagrin. Rick got jealous because Terry wanted to go to a party and basically Jimmy had goo goo eyes for her. Or she probably thought, thought she had goo goo eyes for him and basically put her in a coma. Spinner and Paige want retribution for what Rick did to Terry, but they can't get it because Rick is pulled out of Degrassi and his mom basically tells him to stop abusing her son. So basically Rick's off the show and we're like, will Rick ever come back? I looked at it. I look at it that basically Paige and Spinner were basically kicking themselves because they didn't do more to protect Terry. But I mean, Terry had a lot of things going for her and she should have done something. Or her parent, or her dad. I would say her parents, but I forgot her mom died because Terry's referenced her mom dying in the season two finale when Craig goes off the rails because his father's dead and he doesn't know how to react. So then I took an, I took an analytic mind. Like I looked at the the timeline, like in season four and all that. But I never took a look at the stuff before Rick came back. Now, if you remember, in the third episode of Degrassi, Mercy Street, Rick came back. The other two episodes, the first two episodes, and I am counting the, the I know there was one that was a two-parter, but I should count it as a whole hour, as they usually are a whole hour. And then I count the next one. I would say Islands in the Stream, but I'm not sure if that's the right one. But anyway, the first one was about Paige and, you know, having her rape trial against Dean finally go through. And basically, Dean's lawyer basically doing everything in her power to tell Paige off, trying to make sure Paige slipped up, but Paige never did. Unfortunately for Paige, she loses her court case mostly because of lack of evidence. Also meaning that Paige kept it within herself. She didn't know how she was going to be perceived by people. So she basically 
hid everything from her friends about the rape and all that. She does sing a song about it and get you back, but that's not worth it. Paige actually is worried about the trial and how she's being perceived, so she just, she wanted to cancel it. But Spitter told her off, saying, you have to get this guy. Unfortunately, Paige misses. Dean basically brags about it to his friends and all that. Paige decides to use Spinner's car to crash into Dean's car for revenge. Spinner gets arrested because that was his car that broke Dean, but Paige takes the rap and basically tells Dean, I'm going to confess. That's what good people do when they do something terrible. And we don't see Dean ever again. A lot of people say, well, how does that have to do with the shooting? Plenty. I'll get to that point. And, you know, Marco and Alex being named Student Council President and Vice President, you're thinking, that doesn't lead to anything. Yes, it will lead to something. And, of course, the subplot with Emma being broken up with Chris and then Chris going after Liberty. And Emma, for some strange reason, thinking that if he goes with Liberty, that's going to make people think that, why couldn't he be with Emma? So basically, she tries to ruin Chris and Liberty's relationship, even though Chris was really not that interested in Liberty. Too bad Emma didn't know that, and Emma ended up losing a relationship, her friendship with Liberty and Manny. So, yeah, that has to do with the shooting. I'll explain what. And then, of course, in Mercy Street, Rick comes back. Everyone is shocked, especially Spinner and Paige, because, you know, the last time they saw him, he was running away from them with blood on his hands. So basically, they talk about why Rick is coming back to Degrassi. And they even look at Emma and say, watch out, Emma. He's a tenor. Well, he's a sophomore because Rick lost a year. He will probably get close to a girl and all that. Keep yourself. Yeah, because of the domestic violence thing. Marco and Alex decide to go to Radish and try to make him realize he's making a dumb mistake. And in the deleted scene, why they didn't put it in the main episode, I don't know why. But anyway, they talk to Radich and all that. Radich practically tells Marco and Alex that the thing is that Rick never got charged for anything. And so practically, you know, without a criminal charge from anybody, even Terry's dad, that could have helped out. Nothing can be done about it. And besides, it was off school property, which is actually hard. Because, of, you know, the paperwork and all that. Marco believes that it's just to raise the student's GPA up a bit. But Raj denies it. Alex has a big, big beef because, you know, she has, a, she has to deal with domestic violence through her mother. <clears throat> because her mother has a lot of abusive boyfriends. Unfortunately, Raj refuses to budge. And, of course, it gets me wondering. I still have this feeling to this day, why the hell wasn't there a criminal charge? Even one tiny little misdemeanor charge. Rick probably would never get back to school. The police and or the school board would have had to tell Radich not to allow Rick back. I mean, the school board, you can kind of blame the school board in a sense. Because if the school board knew about Rick being troublesome going back to Jurassic, they would have told Radich. <clears throat> Unfortunately, Marco and Alex go away from that meeting pissed off and all that. And I don't blame them one bit. I mean, Raj is obviously not listening to them. Raj, of course, gets mad at Emma for tripping Rick in the hallway. But Emma tells him straight out, nobody wants him at this school. She was just being brutally honest. But unfortunately, Raj basically gets at her saying that this is not one of your stupid causes. If you know Raj, is that he's actually tired of Emma's crusades because, you know, the genetically modified foods... Storyline from season two was a key important thing. And we kind of saw, and I kind of looked at it, and I saw that Raj had not changed his persona. Like, I watched that Breakfast Club episode in season three, like the first first run, and I'm like, you know, did he need to punish all these students? Well, in a way, yes, he did. Because, you know, Hazel was looking at some inappropriate stuff on school time. That's a thing. That was what happened in high school with me. Not, no, I didn't get in trouble, but, you know, the way it was. Because, you know, the internet was at its infancy. Toby and um, Jimmy got in trouble because of changing Jimmy's grades on a computer. That's plausible. Sean, for some reason. But, of course, I mean, Raj had it in for Sean. He basically blamed Sean for a few thefts, even though Sean had nothing to do with it. And all that. You could kind of tell that he wanted to destroy Shine. So 
So then, and, you know, Ellie was there probably to cut class because she was cutting class too much because of her pain and suffering from her mom being an alcoholic when her dad's off in the service. A lot of people actually said that they didn't think so. They actually think that Ellie was brought in just to keep an eyeball on things and all that. And yet, Ellie had taped some discussions and all that. That could have been it. Raj probably could have planted Ellie in just to make sure everything was funky dory. And, you know, they didn't, they wrecked the tape. They could have had the tape and they could have forced Ellie. To, and if it was Raj, then Raj would definitely have been kicked out because he couldn't trust his students. And then we would have seen the end of Raj before season four. But anyway, it, it comes across as if the students are helpless. Basically, the administration's not doing a damn thing. And Rick is basically probably laughing in their faces, saying that you can't touch me and all that. Rick does admit he's changed a bit. And he's getting therapy and all that, but no one believes him. Paige knows that Rick has to be stopped at all costs. And decides to recruit Emma, because Emma is the cause girl, who has basically, the first three seasons, basically put a lot of causes on display. So, what you got here is an easy way for Emma to get fit in. Because, you know, Emma does not have any friends with Manny and Liberty basically cutting her out of life. Emma decides to join the cause, not just because she wants, she wants to help destroy Rick. She wants to fit in with somebody. So they come up with an orange ribbon campaign. I thought it was roses for the longest time, but no, it was an orange ribbon campaign. And it seems to be working. Paige is happy about it. Alex is happy about Emma's cause. Raj even looks a little bit stunned, but I don't know what he was thinking. But unfortunately, what Emma did not see, and I can I cannot blame her, is that the students were going to use this cause as a way to destroy Rick for his domestic violence thing. Yes, Rick deserved to have a little bit of revenge, but not a whole lot of revenge. I mean, Rick was upset at himself. Like, Rick just wanted something to stop. But Rick actually had the foresight to talk to Emma about it and basically tell Emma that, you know, I'm donating this money to domestic violence things. I'm sorry about what I did to Terry, blah, blah, blah. Alex sees them and basically rips up the check saying that you don't deserve to give money to a cause. You are an abuser. Once an abuser, always an abuser. And Alex writes, this, tells the story about how her mother would cry herself to sleep and Alex would help her. And basically tells off Emma saying that you don't know what it's like. Why would you accept the money? It's not clear if Emma was going to accept the check. She probably could have accepted the check and basically tore it up and say, throw it back in his face. You never know. I think that's what she might have done. Unfortunately, Emma is told not to be any, not to have any positive thoughts about Rick. So Emma trips up Rick at the dock. Rick goes up, gets up, wants to talk to Emma. But unfortunately, Snake, um, Spinner and Jay obviously think that he's going to attack her. Wrong move. He was just standing up and walking towards Emma. Unfortunately, they beat Rick into submission. Emma basically saves Rick's hide. The, the clique decided to cut Emma out and said, this is, your cause is over. No cause is worth this. So basically, the domestic violence cause is ripped up because, you know, they tell everyone that Emma is such a hypocrite and all that. Emma, the next day, sees Rick and tells him that what she did was only because she couldn't stand him being bullied and all that. And Rick thinks that, you know, she has an affection with him. But, no, Emma tries to talk to Rick about why he came back to Degrassi. Rick says, I'm only back at Degrassi because I want people to know that I changed. Emma says, I don't think that's going to work. They're not going to believe you. They will, someday. Of course, Emma is obviously now without a lot of friends because now not only has she lost Manny and Liberty, she's lost the popular crowd, the clique. But a few episodes later, we basically see Emma knowing that the only people she hangs around are the Quiz Bowl team of Toby, Rick, and Heather St. Clair. Toby and Rick actually pair up to do a kissing contest, which Toby easily wins because no one wants to come close to Rick. Toby actually ends up giving Darcy some money to kiss Rick, feeling that a blowout victory is not worth it. Unfortunately, Toby gets the wrath of Spinner and Jay basically by saying that, you know, 
a Niners gang stalked and all that. You're just making Rick worse. Rick's going to go after Darcy. Actually, no, because Rick admitted that that kiss with Darcy made him want to go after Emma. Bad move. We see Rick trying to help the school out by a car wash, but nobody wants to deal with Rick's car or anything else. It's apparent that the students practically, you know, um, and I didn't really analyze this as much as I did until like a few weeks ago, but the more I think about it, the more I'm analyzing that, you know, the students were probably taking their aggression out on Rick. Well, you know, domestic violence. But I also think that the students were also taking out their aggression against Radish on Rick. Basically, their aggression is that, you know, Mark and Alex must have spread the word, especially Alex, that, you know, Radish is refusing to do a damn thing about Rick. Not believing him, not even telling Rick, one false move, you're out the door type of person. That's the thing. I think the students were more pissed at Radish for not listening to their complaints than, you know, beating up on Rick. But, oh, but some students did that a lot. Over time, we do see that the pages click actually disappears. Jimmy doesn't really torment Rick that much. So when I analyzed Time Stand Still, I found out that I made a few videos and I made a few mistakes, and I made a big mistake saying that Jimmy and Spinner dumped Rick into the dumpster that made him see the paint cans, the spray cans. Unfortunately, I'm wrong. It was Spinner and Jay, not Jimmy, but Jay. And Rick obviously went to reta retaliate with the circle and the X. Now, the thing I know is that, you know, Rick, I think, had it in his head. I mean, yeah, he retaliated. But I think in Rick's mind, he was like, I'm being bullied for this. Let's see the shoe on the other foot and see how they react. And basically, they might get their feelings hurt like I've got my feelings hurt. Unfortunately, his way of thinking was incorrect as basically Alex said something and they want to turn Rick in, inside out. Spinner and Jay want to go to Radish for the information, but Sean refuses to have it because Sean's going to say that they'll demand why Rick did this. Basically, then that would incriminate themselves. So basically, what ends up happening is that they have to get Rick back somehow. In the meantime, Rick, after doing his deed, if you will, bumps into Jimmy in the hallway. Jimmy is asked by Snake about Rivers and the Boston Celtics. Jimmy is now part of the Quiz Bowl team because Heather St. Clair, the famous unseen character, caught Mono. It was kind of strange to see that if if Heather did not catch Mono, what? how would the storyline have been? Maybe Toby has a crush on Heather. We could only hope. No, sorry, not Toby, Rick, if you know what I mean. Hmm. But anyway, Rick refuses to be on the quiz bowl team with Jimmy and says, I have to figure something out. Emma tells him to tell Simpson. Wrongo. Simpson will probably blab and I'm going to get in trouble. And Rick says, wait a minute, I have another plan. He goes to Radage. Now, when I analyze the discussion between Rick and Radage, you know, it's like, you know, Radage is being kind of a tyrant. And why the hell is he not protecting Rick? I thought he said he was going to protect Rick at the school. And why did he leave him high and dry? Now, but I did analyze it. If it wasn't for Not a Vampire's video about did Radish mishandle Rick, I would not have known this. Because I looked at the conversation again and it was like, wait a minute, Rick never said, Rick said Jimmy was tormenting me and not being my friend. But he never said Jimmy was a bully. He basically says that Jimmy doesn't like me and I don't like him. And Radish puts that thinking into thought and decides to tell Rick to make make better after making friends. It takes two to tangle. Come back to me when something serious happens. The more I think about it, the more I'm right. Rick, as I said in one of my play my playlist about um Rick not going not properly telling people how he feels. Like he didn't tell Radish completely how Jimmy was tormenting him. If he knew, if he told that, I think Jimmy would have been in trouble. And I think the whole thing would have went down the hill. But Rick never specifically said that. Rick has a funny way with words. And I thought he was, like, generally smart. I thought he would know that. But I guess his social awkwardness basically cost him dearly. 
thankfully for Rick, he and Jimmy actually do become partners because of Toby. Because Toby gets hurt by Spinner and Jay, who want answers to where the hell Rick is. Because, you know, they know Toby is with Rick. After Toby gets a busted lip, Jimmy tries to talk, but Rick says, nobody deserved this. I've been through this for a long time. And he, I think, implies that, you know, if Rick's not going to get beaten up, it's going to be Toby, because Toby's affiliated with Rick. Um, so Jimmy basically has it, right, so basically Jimmy and Rick get along with each other, which is amazing. But the fact of the matter is, that's a catalyst for the conversations with Spinner, Jay, and Alex. It's pretty much apparent that Spinner, Jay, and Alex are the only three that are willing to torment him. Paige is not really there to torment. I think Paige realized that Rick can't be stopped and, you know, all that stuff. So what happens? Jimmy stands up for Rick. Rick then turns around and flashes at the three tormentors. Bad move, Spinner said, and Jay said, true, you're right. If Rick hadn't done that, things would have been much better. But I think they were still going to think of the, the prank on Jimmy and Rick. Now, say what you want, but I still think that Spinner and, Jimmy, and Jay, when they did the paint and feathers, also had it in the back of their head to try to destroy Jimmy because, you know, Jimmy was on his side now. Not on their side, but on his side, that being Rick's side. We get a glimpse into his home life when his mother tries to help him into a suit for Wacky Brain. Rick laments the fact that his dad's not going to be around to see him. And Rick's mom said, he's a traveling salesman. What do you expect, Ricky? So basically, Toby comes by to talk to Rick. However, Rick's mom says that, you know, Rick says that, you and Toby are going to rule the school with this thing, right? Oh, yeah, of course. A little uneasy. And then basically she makes the note that, and to think, I just wanted you to go to another school. You worry too much. It's apparent that, you know, she wanted Rick to go to another school, thinking that Degrassi had retribution. But, you know, it was Rick's choice, and I guess her mother-son relationship with him was kind of awkward, but, you know, strange. So anyway, in all honest opinion about this, um, what ends up happening is that Toby's uneasy because Rick is basically lying to his parents about the torment he's getting. Obviously, Rick is not going to allow his parents to get into the mess because that could make him get things worse. And I mean, the torment Rick got and all that, I'm surprised that his parents didn't clue in. But they also knew that it was Rick's decision to come back to the grassy, so he should basically tell him. I think they were begging him. If anything bad happens to me, tell to you, tell me, and then I'll tell the school. That could have been easy, too. That could have stopped the the torment right there and then. Mrs. Murray was basically going to tell Raj, and Raj had to stop it, or else face consequences. So, yeah, I looked at the, um, the wacky brain thing, and it ended up being tied and going to a tiebreaker, which obviously begs the question, will Degrassi beat Norfolk Tech? Now, Part of me also realizes that I think game shows would have done that anyway. I think the game show would have done it anyway. I mean, if they didn't have the tiebreaker around, how the heck was paint, the paint and feathers going to hurt Rick and all that? I mean, Spinner, Jay, and Alex didn't realize that the tiebreaker round might not have happened. And then how are you going to paint and feather um, Rick? But thankfully, the score was tied. Alex leaves her seat, and Spinner and Jay go to the bathroom. They bump into Jimmy and Rick and basically congratulate them. Spinner and Jay's motive is easy to see, that they were trying to get Rick to basically calm down, realize that Spinner and Jay were not upset anymore about Terry being hurt, and they basically paint and feather him, basically make him part of the tiebreaker round. Spinner, of course, has his doubts because Alex might not, have pull, might not pull it off. But Jay tells him that Alex knows what she's doing. That's what you get when you date the VP of Student Council. Nobody has questions. So after Norman Tech has guy come in, Jim, uh, Rick does miss a few questions, but he wins the tiebreaker on the final seconds, and guess what? 
He wins. He's praised. And then the pain and feathers fall. Everyone laughs at him. A lot of people are disgusted by it. Mostly staff members and, you know, Emma and them. But you also have to analyze Rick's behavior towards Emma. I know that Rick basically told Emma, thanks for helping me get together with Jimmy and all that. Okay, that's fair. But Rick is smiling at her, grabbing her hand. And then just before he goes up to the stage, he goes to her. It's apparent that Rick has an affection for Emma, mostly because, you know, Emma at least stood up to the bullies for him. No one else would. That's the kind of sentiment I'm thinking about later, talking about. But anyway, so Rick is there with the pain and feathers. He looks bad, but Emma cheers him up saying that, you know, no one's going to think about this. You helped the school win a major competition. And then Rick approaches Emma with a kiss. What are you doing? I thought you loved me. I only pitied you. Get a clue. And Rick is sitting there, standing there, looking down with a trophy in his hand. Rick goes home. Not in his parents is home, are home. I don't know why he calls out for them. He knows his dad's at work and his mom's probably at work too. No one else is there. He then goes to his dad's desk, finds a gun, looks at it, looks up. It's like, what's he going to do? Is he going to kill himself or is he going to kill someone else? And then we get that freeze frame. Now, I also decided to analyze um, that subplot that basically has been crapped on about Joey and his house and how Craig had to ask Sydney for help and jo Joey was not too happy with Craig. And even though Craig was sick, Craig had to go to school the next day to escape Joey's wrath. But Joey does admit that Craig it was doing the right thing. I think he just beat himself up saying, why didn't I listen to Craig? I'm such an idiot. But anyway, regardless of what ends up happening, like, you know, this was part of the Grassy shooting thing because if Craig was sick and stayed home, Craig would not have witnessed what would have happened. Give you a bit of insight towards it. And yeah, of course, the, the B plot led into the A plot. I'll tell you how. So Time Stands Still Part 2 happens. And of course, that's 15 years ago today. So anyway, Rick still has the gun and looks worried about it. JT, Danny, that being Manny's, I mean, Libby's brother, Emma and Toby talk about Rick being painted feathered and basically saying, are they going to show that on TV? Emma says that, don't worry, they'll cut out that part before the painted feathers fall. JT and Danny were laughing because there's like, that was so funny. Toby says, what would that what would you think if that happened to you? Would you laugh? Uh, Danny says, I would. And speaking of loose ends, Rick comes to the school still in the paint and feathered clothes and all that. That's kind of like, he must be in a zombie trance because it's like, you know, Rick went home, but Rick could have changed his outfit. Who knows? He's clutching his backpack. You can probably guess the gun's in his backpack. Toby tries to calm Rick down. Rick refuses to listen and goes into the school. Raj is practically just going AWOL. About, I know about this. But JT tells Toby that I hope he takes the hint and leaves Degrassi. Because that's obviously the plan to make him leave Degrassi. Everyone was on board with him leaving Degrassi. Rick somehow decides to walk into the cafeteria Look at Paige and slowly is about to raise the gun from his backpack. Paige talks him off the ledge by saying that Paige realizes how stupid everything has been. And Rick realizes that Paige has been genuine. And then he just slowly puts the gun down. Paige doesn't see any part of the gun. And says, I'm sorry for what I did to Terry. And all that. So he apologizes for the first time generally. I mean, it would have been nice to see Rick apologize, try to apologize a couple times. And if they didn't accept it, that's on their fucking heads, not his. So anyway, Spinner decides to tell Jimmy that it was fun and all that, seeing all Chicken Boy and all that. Jimmy doesn't like it, but Spinner says, yeah, yeah, but why are you defending him? He's not your friend. And they get in this huge fight, literally. And in the deleted scene that Stipperly was not taken into the episode, Spinner mocks Rick. Well, unfortunately, he bumped, 
he bumps into Radic, and Radic basically wants Spinner to meet him for a talk at 3.30. Radic then talks to Rick, saying that he felt bad for what happened to Rick. You can go home. Rick says, well, I want, I'll go to my locker. Radic says, okay, but leave immediately. Snake is not infused, impressed with how Radic is handling the meetings. Radic says he can't do much harm if he's not here. Spinner says, and then Snake goes, well, what about the next day and the day after? What's your long-term plan? And then Radish says, this is not kindergarten. It makes it's not part of the curriculum. That makes me think, what was he talking about? But then I finally clicked in a couple of days ago and said, Radish completely botched it with Rick. We all know that. But here's the thing about Radish, is that he still thinks that Rad uh, Rick has a problem making friends and all that. He doesn't realize the scope of how Rick's being treated and the scope of her being tormented. And obviously, he kind of knows about Spinner, though, too. So anyway, Rick goes back to his locker. He puts the gun in his locker, and he practically just washes up. But then he hears Spinner and Jay, or he hears somebody, so he decides to duck into the stall. I think he would have ducked into the stall if it wasn't Spinner or Jay. Spinner realizes what he's done and tells Jay, basically, that you know, Rash knows. And then Jay looks around and says, about Jimmy? Spinner says, what are you talking about? And then Jay points out the the paint and feathers that are in the skull. And then Spinner changes his story to coincide with Jay, basically saying that Jimmy's an inside man. They were basically hoping that, you know, Rick and Jimmy's friendship would be bursting the bubble. And I think Spinner and Jay were hoping that they would have Jimmy back on their side because obviously they were hurt that Jimmy would actually walk away from the cause, or their cause, if you will. Unfortunately, what they don't see is that Rick now realizes now that someone's playing him, playing him around. And, of course, because he kind of believes Spinner and Jay, he believes their bullshit, he feels that he needs to get rid of Jimmy. Jimmy tries to run. Rick actually ends up turning his head while shooting Jimmy. And that's vital because it got, yeah, the bullet got Jimmy in the spine. But if Rick was if Rick was looking at Jimmy, he probably would have shot him in the head. Or he probably just wanted to hurt Jimmy, not kill him. And then Craig sees Jimmy's body. Craig just had to see that body of Jimmy twitching. Oh, my God. See the one I meant? Like, you know, Craig would not have had to see his best friend's body in front of him. Not corpse, but body. Students run. Unfortunately, Emma, Sean, and Toby don't really run. They see Rick, and Rick's got a gun. Sean says, he's got a gun. Let's go. Don't turn away from me. And basically, he makes this whole thing about how Emma is at fault. Because Emma let him along. She just wanted to embarrass him, not realizing Emma's full scope of ha protecting him. Sean says, you're going to do something dumb. Don't do anything rash. And, you know, Sean had an experience with a boy he deafened, and things looked bad. But Rick says, I already shot somebody, and decides to shoot Emma. Thankfully, Sean's reaction time saves that, and Sean didn't. Rick wrestles for the gun. Toby tries to stop him. Emma tries to stop him. But no, we hear a gunshot. They both scream like they've got shot. We don't know what happens. And then we get the Joey storyline. And basically, Joey and Caitlin have to stop talking to each other but saying, oh my God, they're shooting at the school. So practically, the school's on lockdown. Police are right there interviewing people. And then, where's Toby's mom? Kate. Um, Kerwin. Kate Kerwin, she was told by the school to come by and comfort Toby because, you know, that's Toby's mom. So anyway, what ends up happening is that Toby gets interviewed by a police detective about Rick. Toby has no clear answers on why Rick would do such a thing. He calls him a psycho on that. In the background, Sean, with a arm in a cast, is talked to by Radish. It's apparent that the gunshot happened, but we don't know if Rick's dead or not because we see Sean with the cast on, and we're thinking the, the bullet might have gotten him. All of that. In, in the meantime, Snake and Spike are in the media room comforting Emma. 
Spike talking to her and Snake saying that he just needed help and love. How were, how were we going to know these things? And then all of a sudden, Radish pops into the media room and wants answers for, like, email, warning signs. Little signs. Snake says fine, but he also decides to give Radish a piece of his mind. When I look at that scene, I'm like, does Radish really want the answers? Or does the police want the answers? Because there was a police officer there. I think the police wanted Radish to find the warning signs, and then that means Radish will go to Simpson. Of course, Raj thinks that Simpson's going to help him. One problem, though, Simpson is not too pleased. He basically tells Radish that, you know, you could have done a whole lot of things. You talked to him a couple times in the past few days, and you don't, I don't think you remember what he said. Radish counters with the fact that, I have 700 students. How am I supposed to know that one of them would have had a gun? And he's right. When I analyze that, I'm like, Radish is right. For how much you have to hate on the guy, he's right. How did he know that Rick was going to have a gun? And Snake basically said, this shooting, this tragedy might have been averted. Damn it, if you have no. Archie, stop this right now. So they both dis decide to, to agree to disagree. And basically, you know, that's what happened. I can't blame Snake for being mad. And partially it's because, you know, that his stepdaughter nearly died. I think he probably would have done all that if it was like Jimmy and not Emma. What do you expect? So then when Paige gets the word that there's been a shooting, Hazel turns around and sees an empty desk, that being Jimmy's desk. It doesn't find Jimmy. So she instantly feels the worst. And when Miss Silve tells her that, yes, it's the worst, Hazel's got to go to Jimmy. But they said, the school's in a lockdown. Once it's over, we'll get you to the hospital as fast as possible. God. It's like, what the hell is school? Lockdown? Over. Now the students have to go home. But the reporters want to talk to a few of them. Toby, in particular. Oh, by the way, I didn't mention that Toby's mom actually had the misfortune of seeing Jimmy on the, stretch, on the gurney headed to the hospital. So Toby learns that his friend's dead. So that's when we learned that Rick is dead because of the gunshot. Wow. Either it was self-inflicted or Sean might have did it on, might have did it. You never know. I don't know. Maybe it was self-inflicted. I don't know. But what we do know is that Craig is interviewed and basically Caitlin said, shut up. This is a friend of mine. He shouldn't be interviewed like that. So basically, in the aftermath, they watched the news and all of that. And basically, Spike says, why would it happen at a school? It shouldn't have happened at a school. Snake makes the point that we all didn't take it seriously enough. Why did we wait for this to happen before we saw the warning signs? I did something about it. Toby is upset because now his best friend is now described as a psycho and a school killer, a school shooter. Well, and who knows, maybe he killed Jimmy. Ashley makes some points about it, saying that this psycho made him the top, us the top news story. And I don't know what he was. He shot Jimmy. Mom, I want answers. And Toby, he was Toby's friend. Toby, of course, doesn't realize that. So, yeah, we see some parting shots of, you know, Craig with Joey and Caitlin on the couch. Sean and Ellie. Basically, everyone just reacting. Paige and a few other friends talking about how Jimmy is in a in the coma or whatever. I don't know what's happening. Spinner wants to come by and comfort. I just wish Spinner had come in. It's also imperative to know that I don't know why I keep forgetting it. I did a practice run and I kept and I forgot to say this, but Spinner is told by Jay and Alex is found by Jay and Alex. Say but Spinner was shot. Spinner says Jimmy got shot. We got Jimmy shot. I have to tell somebody. And Jay says, no, don't, don't. I can't do that. Spinner says, he's my best friend. I owe it to him. Either way, he was your best friend. Either he's alive or he dies. He was your best friend. There's nothing you can do about it. Spinner is brought with guilt because now he realizes that Rick had a gun on him the whole time and Rick shot Jimmy. It could have been worse. If Spinner and Jay had been found out, Rick could have shot them. 
So then you get yourself back in black. You get yourself the episode coming back. And there are people like, they're going back to school regularly just a weekend after the shooting? Well, no. What ends up happening is that it's a moment of reflection. You can come to the school for an hour a day to, well, I mean, for an hour to talk to Solvay, talk to grief counselors, do, and if you need to do some schoolwork, you can do that without being pressured because there's no classes. Sean relishes being a hero. He's on the front page of all the newspapers and the TV stations all of them. Marco wants to know why Jimmy got shot and why Rick did what he did. Despite the fact Rick is, of course, dead and all that. A lot of students have different opinions. Craig is upset that they're making Rick almost look like a saint because of, you know, how he's being bullied and all that. He shot somebody. Toby's, of course, upset because, you know, everyone's perceiving Rick to be a bad guy. And Toby doesn't know how to feel. Poor guy has a, an internal conflict that he can't muster and all that. This isn't about blame, um, Snake tells Craig. This is about finding out answers. And even though that Rick got bullied, you know, why are we praising this guy? Point taken. I mean, I understand what Craig's saying. Sean is basically told by um, Snake that you should talk about it and all that. And then Emma bursts into the media room saying, Dad, I can't take this anywhere. Everyone's staring at me. Mostly because, you know, they found out that Emma was targeted by Rick and Rick had an obsession with Emma. And so she hugs Sean and says, thank you for saving my life. It got me thinking about a month ago saying that if Sean had not been the one to protect Emma, would she be protected? And the fact of the matter is that Emma had spent the better part of the of season four yes, getting on school's nerves, especially protecting Rick. You know, it was their job to destroy Rick, force him back to the grass seat, come hell or high water. And they were, of course, upset that Emma would do such a thing as protect him. Of course, they couldn't really go after Emma because that was against the point. Because Emma was a girl and it would have been domestic violence. Something that they sh sure as sugar didn't want to be hypocrites themselves. They didn't see the whole story with Emma and all that. But a lot of people said that, you know, I don't think they had that much mouse towards Emma. I think some people did have mouse towards Emma. That's why they ignored Emma and left Emma with Toby... Rick and Hannah Sinclair's friends. So, of course, Back in Black also marked when Sean went back home to Wasaga Beach after talking to his parents and saying that his parents were bullshit for because, saying bullshit because, you know, they sent him to Toronto. But it was because of how he deafened that boy, Tyler. He would have been in jail. He would have been in jail if the parents didn't send him to Toronto. So, lo and behold, at the beach, he finds Tyler. Tyler basically gives him a jet ski to rent, and Sean goes jet skiing. Unfortunately, Je Sean has an accident and nearly dies, but Tyler, thank goodness for his heart, saves him. Because that's what he does. He's a lifeguard. So anyway, Sean knows that his life is flashing before his eyes. He apologizes to Emma about being a jerk to her the previous year, and basically realizes how he, he's taking the tragedy. And he's not taking it well. He's like, he feels so guilty about his, about killing a kid. Despite the fact that the police would definitely never have gone after him for the shooting. Because, I mean, it was in self-defense. I mean, and how did you know you, sh you had the, the hand on the trigger that would have put the bullet, in Rick, the bullet in Rick's head or something? Whatever happened to Ricky. The fact of the matter is that... I also think that Sean feels guilt because what, what happened is he told Spinner and Jay to not let Raj get involved in this situation that you got to do yourself. He probably thought that by that, Spinner and Jay obviously thought the pain and feathers thing was the best way to get Raj out of the way. Well, Sean came back in season six, mostly to break up Pema, if you will. I won't get into that, obviously, because this is season four and this is the timeline. But of course, what we forget in Back to Black, Back in Black, is that Toby gets harassed by JT and Danny. I doubt they were the only two classmates to put things on Toby because you know Toby was friends with a psycho and all that. 
Toby is upset. He tells Manny everything. Manny decides to do something about it and tell JT that, you know, you're the one at fault. Because if JT wasn't so enamored with Webster, that's her pet nickname for Danny, then, you know, maybe Toby would not have been friends with Rick. Maybe he would not have had to be friends with Rick. JT doesn't believe her one bit and says, who abandoned who? And Manny goes, I guess I was right about something new. You couldn't be the bigger man. Danny was ready to make a penis pump joke. Don't you say it. At the visitation, and I found out that it is a visitation at the funeral. Um, not many people come by. I think it's just relatives of Rick warning him. The school basically stays away from Rick. Mostly because, A, they have guilt about, you know, what they did to Rick and how they took, made Rick into a school shooter. And B, basically, they didn't want to go anywhere near a school shooter. It's great. Oh, the casket. It's imperative that Toby, JT, and Manny be remembered as the only three uh, Dragassians who went to the funeral. And Rick's mom was blissfully ignorant as possible. I don't care what you say. I think she was blissfully ignorant and all that. And that's the last time we saw her. My theory is that basically the police got mad at her and her husband because, you know, the gun was in safe, was in safe range of Rick picking it up and all that. So basically they had to deal with a lot of fallout. And 15 years later, I mean, the victims, like the families, other school shooters, I think they get a lot more sympathy, more so from the police than anything else than they used to. Because I think the police basically said that your son's a school shooter, we're not helping you out, you get nothing. No retribution, no redemption. Good day. So anyway, yeah, that's freaky. And then, you know, I I didn't end this the next episode because it had nothing to do with the shooting. I mean, yeah, there was scenes about, you know, Jimmy being in the hospital still. Like, he's still alive, but that doesn't have anything to do with anything else. And then the big, the next big episode to do something about it was Voices Caring. I know it was a two-parter, and I know that the A-plot was about Craig's problems with Ashley and his bipolarism coming out. But the B-plot was the main reason why. Liberty and JT are putting on Dracula, and they put on a good show for Dracula, for Miss Kwan, Mr. Radich, and a few other people. Maybe a school board trustee but, but Raj wants to talk to JT and Liberty, basically saying that we can't put this on because of Rick's death, all of that. Liberty says that, you know, it's to make the school heal. Can't we find something else to help the school, like a musical? JT says, a musical, perfect. Get on it. That's, get on it with the drama club. Let's go. I don't think the drama club would do a musical. That's kind of off-putting. Drama and musical are two things that don't completely mix, if you will. Sometimes they do. But the problem with Raj is that, you know, the more I analyze it, the more I think that deep down inside, this is just a ploy to try to make himself feel better about himself. I mean, fair enough, yes. It was. It is at a time and a place that, you know, is dark and all that for him. So what do you expect? from him. All he does is basically saying that, you know, due to the nature of the events, it gets me thinking is that, yes, I understand there's been a shooting, but he could have done one of two things. One, he could have basically said, we have to postpone this until further notice. And then once everything is back to normal, then we can go back ahead and do the play. Or number two is, can we find some com ground, like compromise? If memory serves me right, and I know I don't really reference Degrassi Junior High and Degrassi High that much, well, obviously, I would be too young for those shows, unless I was seeing my reruns, which I sometimes do. But when Claude killed himself during Degrassi High, like, there was this talent show happening at the same time. Some people wanted to cancel it, some people said the show must go on. Spike came up with the bright idea to have both. Like, you know... Claude's death was terrible and all that. So the talent show should go on, but then make it a benefit for, like, depressed teens and all that. And it was a hit. So practically what 
could have happened if anyone went back to their memory bank is basically make a compromise. Having like a benefit for like bullied teens or teens that feel like killing somebody or something like that. But I think a lot of people probably wouldn't be on board because, you know, Rick was a psycho. So it's apparent that Raj is obviously thinking of himself. After all, his school is now on the 6 o'clock news in a negative light. And he's worried about things. But I also think that they didn't point out that Rick, he probably was worried about Rick's parents. Because Rick's parents could have the right to sue him in a civil trial. But I think Raj probably didn't realize that maybe the police might have been prejudiced and just saying, you're a census goal shooter. Yeah, but... Radich basically didn't, your son's a school shooter. Yeah, but he didn't do enough. The school didn't do enough. Your son is a school shooter. He don't get any sympathy from anybody. Nobody is allowed to give you sympathy. Your son's a school shooter. End of story. That's probably the thinking of people. Like, you know, they never got retribution or anything because their son was a school shooter, and that trumps everything else. And, of course, you know, Murray's going to prison for firearm problems, if you will. So, yeah, so Liberty and JT decide to write this song, Getting Mad at Radage, and this drama club refused to sing it. Alex says, I'm all about rebellion, but I don't want to be expelled. And Emma says, sorry, Liberty, nice try, though. It's apparent that, you know, they don't want to run foul of the administration, because off screen, obviously, Radage is putting on, well, I know he puts on a brave face, but he's putting on a brave show of being the number one person saying that, I'm number one here. You don't cross my path, no matter what. So Liberty decides to sing the song to Raj after JT decides to balk. Raj is not happy. You can probably see it. You knew that Raj was not going to be happy that someone actually called him out or basically insulted him. He puts him in Monday detention. The good news about that is that, you know, it gets Liberty and JT close together. So perfect. And then that led through seasons five and six in a sense. The bad news is it also got me to analyze it and thinking that this is what I think about Radich. It's like, it just clicked. It's like, he never likes constructive criticism. Basically, the students come up with a constructive criticism. He's basically quick to saying that I'm the boss here, you do what I say, or basically punishes them. It's like Emma's genetically modified food Thing from season two. I mean, yeah, you know, Raj had the right to take away Emma's flyers and Emma was going to concede. We all know that. But they do that stupid campaign. They get on Emma's side. side. Emma accidentally starts the food fight. She kind of did in a sense, but she didn't think that, you know, ripping away Toby's lunch tray was going to cause trouble. And then, of course, said the food fight was because of the flyers. No, because people like seeing food flying. He basically suspends Emma for the rest of the day. Emma then decides to protest her right to free speech. She then says, okay, generically modified foods. I love talking about them, but it's your opinion. You don't have to agree with me. But the one thing you should do is free speech and all that. And you can tell that Radish and Liberty are basically upset that Emma doesn't take the high road. <laughs> Because, you know, Radish probably picks on Liberty because, you know, she knows, he knows that Liberty will not stand up to him. So what ends up happening with Emma is she's suspended for another, for a week. It's probably noting. And Snake points that out, that saying, we're the breakfast club. These kids don't really know anything. They haven't really done anything wrong. Although Snake was away for a few months because of chemo. I mean, fair enough. I mean, Snake did get the wrong information, but Spitter doesn't really... But Radish doesn't really tell them what they did. Um, and, you know, Snake whoever changed his mind. He says, I got shot. That's all that matters. They're kids, Daniel. They're human, just like you and me. So that he basically is mad at them, but decides to let them off Saturday detention. So, basically, it basically plays to his character. His character does not like to be criticized. He's principal. He has been for a long time. He thinks that everyone's going to back down to him. Not everyone. Even Snake. So, unfortunately, Bark at the Moon 
marks the end of Raj once and for all. He says he's been reassigned. The way you look at his facial expressions is that he doesn't like the fact that he's being like this. It's like, what did I do wrong? And he leaves. And he makes, and then, and they decide to give him a proper farewell. And it's like, Raj wasn't punished that much because he was allowed to make a speech to Degrassi and leave on his own terms and get a gift from Marco and the student council. Okay, fair enough. But it also is imperative to realize that the way Raj left could have been much different. The way I figured it and the way that the Reddit community tells me is practically that Raj um, had one major option. He had to tell the truth. They might have investigated. There might not have been a police investigation. It might have been a school board investigation and Raj would have had to tell the truth. Simple as that because if Raj had tried to um, have his care have his care bring up his character and all that, try to hide something, and if he's found out, Raj not only would lose the reassignment, he would have been fired and possibly, possibly they could have put a civil lawsuit on him. And I think Raj was lucky because maybe the the culture in 2004 was going to be that Rick's parents were not going to get any retribution at all. Sickening, I know, but I mean, what can you do about it? So then you got yourself thinking that he deserved it. And he obviously got lucky. I think because of Radish's tenure, being 25 years and all that, he got lucky. He got the reassignment. I think if he was around for like five, ten years, tops, I think he would never get the reassignment. I think he would have been tossed. They would have just tossed him around. The school board, I think, was just, you know, thanking him for being a longtime member, but said that, unfortunately, there are problems and the students are probably not happy with you. No confidence, you're out the door. And unfortunately, we don't get to know what happened to Raj after that. He probably was just upset at himself for what he did and thinking that he should have done more. Or what he should have done, number one thing he should have done was find out the perpetrators to the crime of the FMF. Okay, he did not do it much with Rick, but he could have redeemed himself by <coughs> getting at Spinner. Did he forget that Spinner called him a chicken boy and then, you know, before just before the shooting started, and then basically Spinner was going to get in trouble. If he had known that, he could have summoned Spinner, and Spinner would have confessed to everything. Although, it's hard to say if Spinner actually would have named somebody else. But, he might have taken all the fall. Who knows? That's the problem with him. I mean, the aftermath was the problem. And Hotzalikos allegedly said that that's why Raj was gone, because of him mishandling the school after the shooting. Which is true, because he could have handled it. He could have got a solution, and then all he could have done was not take off the school and all that. I mean, yeah, he screwed up and all that, but the best thing it would have been for him to either do something about the solution or find the solution, and then all I could have said is that, you know, I know Dan Woods probably wanted to leave because he wasn't getting paid enough, and he was on the West Coast. But the fact of the matter is that you know, he could have just left after season four saying that I've done what I did. I have a shooting. It's affected me. I need to leave. He could have left on his own terms and no one would have given a crap. But unfortunately, Radich um, suffered. Sorry about this. I got a sore, sore throat. Obviously, I've been talking for a long time. God, that's good. So anyway, um, now let's talk about Secret, the two partner that changed endless perceptions of things. What we see from Emma is that, yeah, Emma was in a few episodes after the shooting, and she was fine. But the dark side of things come out. Emma is not sociable enough. She doesn't go to events. She doesn't have people over at her house. She's screwing up in Dracula. She's screwing up in school. She's just not her Emma. And it seems like everyone at the school and her parents want to step on eggshells around her. The more I think about it, the more I decided to analyze it. And I analyzed it to the hilt. And I basically came up with a solution. Well, I think the Reddit community would have said that too. But the solution, obviously, is that, you know, Emma always bounces back. They put the, per 
the perception on Emma that Emma always bounces back. Emma does not let anything get in her way, and when there's conflict, she usually gets it solved by herself or some people, and basically, she's fine. She's still the Emma that is the cause girl. But we, but Emma has been bottling up the fact that she's not herself. The shooting affected her. And Emma was not used to saying, oh, I need help, please, I need help, and all that. Emma always got the solution. And the shooting brought out the worst in her character. Basically, what I think, and I'm definitely probably going to be wrong, but Emma probably had the trait inside her that she can handle anything, anything at all. And, you know, the forces inside her would say, you're going to be this way, you're going to be three, one-dimensional no matter what. The problem with Emma is that, you know, she's withdrawn. And I know that a lot of people said that, you know, she should have gotten the help she deserved. People should have said, Emma, we'll get you the help you need. And I hope you can help. They could have just said, Emma, please go to therapy and help yourself and all that. But I think Emma was worried that they would perceive her as being a weakling and all that. Emma has a problem. And the problem is how people perceive her. That's kind of why she was upset at her thinking that, oh, people are going to be like Chris and Liberty together. If Chris couldn't do it with Emma, what's he doing with Liberty? That's why it led to many uh, Liberty saying, but out Emma. Emma couldn't handle it. This was something she never had to handle in her life, ever. A shooting, yeah, but I mean, this internal strife. And the worst part about it is that she basically talks to Jay. I think she wants comfort because, you know, Sean and all that. I think Emma wanted Sean in her life again because Sean was willing to take a bullet for her. Whereas nobody else probably would have done anything about it. And of course, you know, Emma had no relationships after Chris until Peter. But regardless of Emma's thinking and all that, it just didn't work out. I mean, I had to figure that. Emma going down the roof being okay. The only positive was that, you know, it got Emma back to the way everyone perceived her to be. But unfortunately, it came at a cost. Her co star would not kiss her during the Dracula scene because of the gonorrhea attack, thanks to Jay. Practically, that Jay was the bad guy here. And Emma says, you gave me a social disease. Emma realizes that she's not who she should be and basically tells her parents about the outbreak. She doesn't say anything about her bad behavior and all that. But I think she may have made a point, too, that she needed to go get help. And she got the help she needed. I think Spike and Snake finally got her the help she needed. And she confessed everything. And I would have loved to see CTV just go into the psychiatric treatment room and see Emma spill her guts and all that. It would have helped a lot of people. Kind of like when Ellie went to therapy because she was cutting herself and all that. Um, people admitted their own problems. They saw themselves in Ellie and called the helplines and all that. It's a proven fact. But, I mean, Emma knew that now she had to get the help. And she did get the help. And she was kind of herself, which would be bad in season five because of her problems with Emma, with Manny and Peter, all that. I suggest you watch season five to realize what I'm talking about. I don't want to go into it because, A, I've been talking for a long time, and B, I, need, I still need to <clears throat> do season four stuff. So regardless of what ends up happening, I, the Tiger, ends up being the penultimate episode of the aftermath because that's when Jimmy in a wheelchair comes back. He's much better now. He's ready to go and Spinner decides to try to help Jimmy out. Obviously, you know, he wants to make sure Jimmy and him get together and all that. And of course, Spinner, of course, has not told anybody about the circumstances involving Jimmy's shooting and all that. Obviously, Jay's been pressuring him and Alex to keep quiet. So Spinner may Make sure that Jimmy gets rewarded with some stuff and all that. And then Jimmy and Spinner decide to talk to each other. Jimmy says that he wants to be out of the chair and get the award legitimately. <laughs> Spinner says, I know. 
and you can do it. But Jimmy then basically gets upset at himself saying that now that would be great, but I have a bullet in my spine. I'm paralyzed from the waist down. My basketball career, my life, over. It's like pieces of me have been shattered. Spinner says, don't say that about yourself. Jimmy said that what I am is not nothing. Because Jimmy only knows himself as a jock and all that. His life has been changed. I just wish Rick had pointed it higher and just ended it. Spinner's like, you don't mean that. Come on, buddy. And Jimmy says that, you know, the pain and feathers thing, I don't blame Rick at all. But I just want to know why Rick thought I did it. Spinner knew he had to confess. And he was he did the right thing by confessing to Jimmy that, you know, he and Jay were practically, they practically saw Rick in the stall and basically talked like he got it. And then Jimmy finishes what I was saying, and then I got shot. The whole student body knows about Spinner Smith's deeds and all that, and make him persona non grata. Spinner understands. Spinner tries to get things going, but nobody wants to talk to him. Jay is upset because Spinner outed him. Spinner says, Jimmy, the serve, Tenno. And Jay says, well, now, how does it feel being unpopular like himself? Spinner goes, be quiet, Jay. So unfortunately for Spinner, he's got to face things. He decides to get drunk with Jay and try to confront Jimmy and all that and tell him off. But they all ask Spinner to leave. But they all realize Spinner is drunk and going to drive. You could kill yourself. Jimmy stands in the way. Well, his wheelchair stands in the way of Spinner causing trouble. Move, J Jimmy. I don't deserve you. Jimmy says, I'm not letting that happen. Spinner goes, okay, fine. Yell at me. Do whatever you have to do for me to forgive you as a friend. Jimmy says, friend? You've never been my friend. A best friend would not leave his best friend high and dry and basically blamed him for something that he, the person did and got him shot. I have no sympathy for you. You're dead to me. Rightfully so. Spinner, realizing he has no other avenues, decides to talk to Hatzalakos about it and names Jay as a co-conspirator. Doesn't name Alex, but he names Jay a co-conspirator. Basically saying that his bullying of Rick alongside Jay, and he was for the pain and feathers prank. Hatzalakos is shocked because she knows Spinner is a bad person, but this is beyond what she he does. He says, I know if I have to be suspended for this, I'll take it. Suspension? No, no, no. A boy is in a grave, and a boy is now in a wheelchair. Your actions have contributed to this fact. You're, you're expelled. We have a zero tolerance policy. Pack your bags, you're gone. Spinner says, when am I allowed to come back? You will not be allowed to come back this year. You're expelled, your year is done. Spinner can't process it. I think he knows that he did bad, but he didn't think it was going to be that bad. He then suspension was permanent. Which also leads me to analyze about the no tolerance policy. But also first about, Jimmy said that Spinner should not have confessed. Um, if Spinner hadn't confessed and it came out as Spinner, you know, doing all this thing to Jimmy and all that, if it, if the police had found out, then Spinner would have been dead the duck. I know Spinner would have confessed to everything, but it could have made Spinner's thing, life a whole lot worse. I mean, all it did for Spinner is make him lose a year of school, and then Spinner did whatever he could to get make sure that everyone wanted to be around him. Not be his friends, but, you know, tolerate him. It took a while. And with Darcy's interventions, Jimmy actually forgave him. And Spinner doesn't really do anything too rash ever again, because he knows the consequences. Because he now has to pay the consequences as well as Jay. Alex, of course, gets left out. I think the boys wanted to do her a favor. Alex would self-destruct, if you will. Because, you know, the shooting affected her. But are you going to also analyze the fact that the zero tolerance policy is all that? The school board might have enforced it 
telling Degrassi, you have to enforce the zero tolerance policy or else you're dead meat. They could have said that to Radish. And then, of course, you know, they would have gotten rid of Radish. But Hatzel Ackles knew what she had to do. The problem with um, that is that a lot of people said, but Jay probably thinks that Hatzel Ackles expelled them because of how Jimmy got shot. But that was false. Spinner never told Hatzel Ackles about the second part of things, that he and Jay had laid blame on Jimmy to get Rick off their scent. He never says that. The students know that because they heard the spread of the rumors. And it was weird that Hatzel Ackles didn't jump in and talk to Spinner because Spinner would have laughed easily, peasy, lemon, squeezy. Like, Spinner had a conscience. Jay really didn't. I mean, yeah, Spinner... It's a terrible person, but at least he tried to have a conscience. Of course, Jay obviously said that he would never come back to Degrassi because Degrassi knew they had to make um, scapegoats of somebody. They had to blame somebody for the thing, and the two of them were easy prey. But they never went to Spinner. Spinner told on himself and Jay. Spinner is the one. Well, And it's weird how Jay wanted Spinner to hang around him, even though Spinner is the one who betrayed Jay. But Jay realized that, you know, Spinner deserved another chance. Jay was a little bit successful. He helped Sean in season six and officiated a wedding in season nine. Weird. Weird. But, yeah, it's kind of weird when you look at it, when you try to analyze it, is that after, after Eye of the Tiger, how did it affect the characters? And I'm not going to go into too much detail because I get the 40... No, I did a 40-minute video about Aftermath. But lots of people got affected by it. Even season four, Ellie got, got affected because Ellie did not have Sean in her life. She was all by herself. She Because, you know, she and her mom had a falling out because of her alcoholism, because of her mom's alcoholism. But her mom got Ellie to realize that things are good. And then Ellie moves back home. Alex even tells Ellie that you should trust your mom. So, yeah, Ellie got affected. You know, Sean came back after his PTSD in season six and ruined Pema. But I think that was for the best, if you will, because of Peter's behavior towards Emma. I mean, Manny and Liberty, it didn't affect them that much. I mean, yeah, Liberty it affected because of the uh, Dracula and all that. But Manny didn't really hurt that much. But Manny and Li Emma finally became friends again. Liberty took a while to accept Emma back, but, you know, what? that's what happens. Yeah. I mean, big aftermath is like, you know, one aftermath, it's like, you got to think about the aftermaths of the characters that have not returned. Like, you know, at that time, it's like, Sean's gone for good, but Sean came back. However, you can't say the same about Radich, though, because, you know, Radich was out the, the door, and he never returned for any reason. Even that Throwback Thursday episode never had him in, or mention of him. That would have been nice. I know there's that stupid... Drake music video, I'm upset, that talks about Rick in the shooting and all that. It brings people back, but yeah, that's kind of weird. But what I think the problem is, is that the aftermath, the big aftermath is not just Rick, it's Emma. I mean, Emma had a lot of problems. Her relationships with people suffer too. I'm like, she didn't have a relationship with a guy until Peter in season five and that was controversial because why would Emma be with a boy who basically got her best friend in so much trouble that her best friend now has to move in with Emma? Although you can analyze it I don't know if you will, but I can. You can analyze it you can analyze it as stating that potentially that Emma wanted to see Manny suffer because she knows that now Emma's in charge of Manny and Manny has to own up to Emma. And Emma probably thinks that she can go after Peter now because if Manny objects, Emma can just make up lies and force her on the street or something like that. Emma could have been that cruel. She kind of was cruel in the sense of being with Peter when Manny had been hurt. All that. But unfortunately, Emma fell flat. Peter made made Emma woo at her, made Emma woo, and basically wanted to make Emma want it. No guy would do that. I mean, Pema 
did have his strong point with Peter helping come up with her eating disorder, but then Sean somehow randomly came back in the picture. Peter was upset, thinking that Emma was going to be with Sean. Yeah, Emma went with Sean a little bit, but I think she just wanted to see if everything clicked, and it did. Unfortunately for Peter, he took it the wrong way and framed Sean for a crime. He didn't do. Emma was grateful to Peter because, you know, Sean had hit that guy, and now she's with Peter. Unfortunately, Manny and Jay basically team up to teach her that Peter was the bad guy in this situation. Obviously, Jay was with Sean, and Jay was going to help Sean out. And then Emma realized that Peter was a piece of crap, and that everyone was right about him, and breaks it off with Peter. Peter doesn't recover that much, either. I mean, he's with Darcy, but that's volatile. Not just because of those pictures that the middle-aged guy talked to, but the rape situation. And then he goes with Mia, but that storyline breaks up as Mia goes to Paris and Peter is left all by himself. Peter, of course, doesn't want to go to Saskatchewan with his mom at the end of season seven. Can you blame him? I mean, Emma then had a relationship with Damien, mostly because she was still upset over how Spike, I mean, Snake was being portrayed. Eventually, Damien decides to be with Liberty, and Emma does not take offense to it this time, realizing things. I think she learned her lesson about with the Chris situation, but she learned her lesson. Basically, saying that Liberty is the good guy, not not Damien. I didn't want to break up a friendship. And then, and then Emma goes with Kelly, and you know, all that. But it's apparent that Kelly's not happy with how Emma is trying to lead the situation, lead the romance, like be bossing and all that. It seems to me that Emma basically wanted to date someone that her standards were too high. Her standard, her standards probably is like a vegetarian, basically talk about the environment and, you know, be like her. I think Emma wanted to date a clone of her in a boy, in a boy's outfit and doesn't. She gets with Spinner. I think she realizes that she's probably too strict on things and decides to try to lower her standards. Spinner is low standards. <laughs> Oh, yeah. But Rick's death actually ruined this. Rick can be down in hell or wherever he is smiling, saying that he's changed Degrassi. He's changed Degrassi and people's perception and how bullying gets solved and all that. Obviously, Simpson learned from this because, you know, he started being anti-bullying and all that. He knows firsthand how bullying can ruin things. <clears throat> so thank you for... Um, Watching, I hope you watched through this whole video and all that to hear me talk for almost 83 minutes on this topic. But thank you for watching slash listening to my pleas of insanity, if you will, and how I honestly thought about the Degrassi timeline. I also kind of feel great knowing that someone actually did videos to try to counteract me, and it worked. I changed my way of thinking. If I change your way of thinking, perfect. If I don't, that's fine. I'm not here to nag. I'm here to brag. Why I said that, I don't know. But anyway, thanks for watching this show and stay tuned for more videos throughout the day.